Welcome ladies and gentlemen back to Fudge Muppet, my name is Scott and today we are diving back into the Outer Worlds with the brand new DLC Peril on Gorgon. To be honest I hadn't played the Outer Worlds since my 10 or so playthroughs after its initial release so I hadn't touched it in 2020. We finished off with a big video in 2019 that contained all our thoughts and feelings about the game and while it is no new Vegas it definitely is a fun game that I'd recommend experiencing at least once. Ultimately, we thought it was a little bit short and the ending just sort of rolled up really quick, but hey, there were lots of great things about the game too and every game has their flaws. Though there has been some distance between then and now, so in anticipation for this DLC, I started a brand new playthrough of The Outer Worlds for a fresh perspective and just to make sure I'm familiar with it all once again. It would also help give perspective on how the new DLC stacks up with the rest of the game and fits in. I actually got hit with some serious nostalgia. The soundtrack's really nice, the atmosphere is great, and funnily enough, I just feel compelled to describe my new Outer Worlds experience as comfy. Playing the Outer Worlds just feels really, really comfy. Anyways, I play the game through again to the point where I finish off Monarch, and this is actually the point where you can access the DLC. In my opinion, this is actually the perfect spot for it, because, like we have said before, we felt that the game needed another chunky-sized planet of content after Monarch, and this delivers. I did take my time with this DLC, explored and did all the side quests, and it did end up being about just under 5 hours worth of content for me, but in my experience, I have managed to get through Outer Worlds quicker than others, Others, so maybe for others it may be more like the six to eight hours advertised. I mean, to be honest, I never take estimated game time at face value because it's always shorter for me no matter the game. But that aside, let's get into the actual DLC itself. First, we'll go through all the fundamental gameplay differences, new items and weapons, new environments and enemies, new perks, stuff like that. Then we'll get onto the story premise, and then there will be a spoiler section where I give a little mini review on the story and the world building implications at the end. I will give a big spoiler warning before that discussion happens. But now let's start with everything else spoiler free. Gorgon is a fairly large new game space. It's an asteroid with a Spacer's Choice facility that is now since defunct and abandoned. And the only things left on it are experimental creatures, crazed marauders, insane test subjects, salvages, secrets, and a sublight affiliated bar called the Sprat Shack. I do also want to mention that this DLC also takes advantage of newly made areas in pre-existing locations, such as a new area of Groundbreaker, a space station above the gas giant Olympus, and a new building in Byzantium, which are all quite nice and help break up the adventure on Gorgon itself. In terms of environment, Gorgon is quite pretty. I mean, I really like the color purple, but to a certain degree, the environment can suffer from what I call Scylla Syndrome. It's a giant rock in space and can look pretty bland sometimes. However, on the other hand, a lot of the interior Interiors are really posh and cool and at times quite haunting. There's also little nooks and crannies that can be interesting to see, but especially in your playthrough after just coming off of Monarch, which is the best planet in my opinion, Gorgon doesn't look too flash by comparison. By no means is it bad, it's just not that pretty. The only sort of new town or hub is the Sprat Shack and it really isn't anything special. I would really love to see future DLCs to focus on a larger hub, perhaps something like the Emerald Vale a wilderness area with a town filled with a bunch of characters. Now, in regards to the enemy types, there are a few unique ones, but for the most part, they are just kind of reskinned pre-existing creatures. Reskinned marauders, cryomantises, corrosive primals, that kind of thing. Along with that, there's a bunch of new armors that are just reskins and a bunch of new weapons that are reskins. And then there's also a lot of standard weapons with unique abilities, but not unique models. This is by no means a deal breaker or anything, and to be honest, they do do provide some really great new skill bonuses and skill combinations in the unique versions that had me continually considering different build potentials with them all. There are some new science weapons, including this awesome grav blade thing called the Pet, and I'm yet to try it out on a dedicated melee character. And also, there's this healer gun. Basically, you can become like Mercy from Overwatch for your team. So there's a nice variety of new effects and gameplay possibilities to take advantage of, and the Peril of Gorgon DLC adds a bunch of new perks and this new virtuoso skills system, which can be taken advantage of before the actual events of the DLC. Six new 
new perks have been added, two for each tier, along with this virtuoso skill system. Let's explain that first. So you remember in the Outer Worlds how there are certain passive abilities that are granted to your character automatically at different intervals of skill levels. Levels 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. Well, basically this adds a new virtuoso ability which is unlocked at skill level 150. Essentially, it's a super specialization skill buff. And I appreciate this system a lot because one of my critiques of Outer Worlds originally is that with the companion skill boosts, gear boosts, and the skill group leveling system, it is really, really easy to be good at pretty much everything. Of course, you can just choose not to, but you know, it's kind of like putting a cupcake in front of a child. Of course I'm gonna eat it, I love sprinkles. Anyways, the point is by adding these extra rewards for hyper-specialization, it offers new incentive to dig deeper into a skill and devote more points to that singular thing rather than just be good at everything. I will say, I think a few of them are by far not worth it, such as the lockpicking virtuoso skill, which allows the first item in every locked container to be stolen without consequence. Such a specific instance that isn't worth five levels worth of skill investment to take it from 100 to 150. However, on the other hand, there are virtuoso skills like science, which have some very powerful applications. At 150, the crit chance and sway of science weapons are determined by science skill if higher. Meaning if you have 10 heavy weapons or 10 two-handed, but a 150 science skill, the crit chance and weapon sway of the gloop gun or the prismatic hammer would be determined by the science skill rather than the measly weapon skills you have. Pretty interesting potential for those science weapon builds, but overall, it's a cool new system to play around with, and I should also mention that the level cap has been raised so you can go a further three levels to 33. The five new perks are Applied Science, which increases science weapon magazine size by 25%, Nietzsche's Reward, which increases damage by 5% for each floor, meaning a potential 25% damage bonus with maximum floors, there is Assassin, which boosts quiet weapon damage by 25%, Lone Master, which increases all your skills by 5 if you have no companions currently in your party, and it gives you a plus 10 if you have not recruited any companions at all, which has some nifty new applications for Lone Wolf characters. There is also Improvisation Warrior, which increases improvised weapon damage by 300% and reduces their degradation by 75%, so that's weapons like hatchets, shovels, and shears. And finally, there is Concentrated Fire, Fire, which increases your damage by 10% per hit in time dilation, which has some great new applications for builds like our Gunslinger build, who relies on time dilation a lot. Ultimately, there is a nice slew of new build options between the new gear, the new virtuoso skills, and new perks, which is greatly appreciated. But let's get to the story. First, the premise, and then we'll dive deeper. Again, I will warn you clearly before the spoilers begin. So, the premise is that a friend of Alex Hawthorne, the previous owner of The Unreliable, is contacted by an old deceased friend via a message. This tells him of a woman who is hiring freelancers to retrieve her mother's journal from Gorgon. She explains her mother was a researcher on Gorgon, and she basically wants closure about her mother's death. Before I get into spoilers, I want to note that during my playthrough, there was a lot of companion involvement in dialogue, and they also had quite a bit of ambient dialogue contextual to the locations I was seeing. The writing is also on par with the rest of the Outer Worlds, which is rather good, and at times it's actually pretty great. And the revelations of this DLC have some really, really cool world building implications. Now, ladies and gentlemen, go off and enjoy the new DLC right now if you are concerned with plot spoilers. This is your spoiler warning right now. I'll take a few seconds. Right, now we're okay to start discussing spoilers. As it turns out, the Spaces Choice operation on Gorgon was to do with the creation of a drug called Adrenatime, which was initially supposed to be a productivity-enhancing drug. Unfortunately, the drug turned out to instead send its users insane over time, and it turned a whole bunch of people into the Marauders, who would then be unleashed on the rest of the Halcyon system. That's right, the Marauders are not just crazy for the sake of it, they are the results of the experiments on Gorgon. Personally, I think this was a really nice add to the world building that shows how far the corporations have gone and some of the evils they've unleashed. I think it really does enhance the world building of the Halcyon system and it makes this DLC feel very purposeful and tied in to the larger story. So it's a big plus for me. It also reminded me a lot of the creation of the Reavers explained in the Serenity movie of the Firefly series. There is this mysterious figure who tries to stop you, but big surprise. 
Her mother is still alive and she's the one trying to stop you. She doesn't want the Adrena Time formula being revived. I guessed it was her mother the first time I came into contact with this figure and I don't think it's a well-hidden secret. Well, especially now if you're listening to this spoiler section. But overall, the ending implication was compelling. You're essentially given a choice to help the daughter revive the Adrena Time experiments because she believes it can be done ethically and pulled off correctly and the potential to help everyone in the colony is just too great. So she is really earnest in her belief for doing good. On the other hand, her mother wants it shut down because of the horrors it wrought, and she fears restarting the program would unleash another Marauder Wave on Halcyon. What I like about this is that they are both trying to do good, and they just have different ways of going about it. So it's not some black and white, good or evil type scenario. I also think that this whole DLC quest line fits really nicely in between Monarch and the rest of the main game, because it invests you further in the future of Halcyon as a whole before you make your final actions in the game. Ultimately, it's a really solid DLC and I would definitely recommend giving Outer Worlds another playthrough in preparation with this DLC installed to take advantage of some of the new gameplay mechanics as well as experience the story in the larger context of the rest of the game. I think if this DLC were included in the base game to begin with, a bunch of my critiques of the Outer Worlds would have been diminished and I hope that there's more DLCs after this and I'd love to come back after those and sort of review a game of the year edition and see how it all pans out as a full piece. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Gorgon DLC below. I'd recommend it if you love the Outer Worlds to begin with, but then again, I don't think it's going to change your mind on the game if you weren't a fan of the Outer Worlds to begin with. If you already love the Outer Worlds, you will love enjoying more adventures with the crew of the Unreliable. Thanks so much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.